Yes. That. Okay, so we we are recording the screen sharing. Yeah, so again, this will be a presentation about uh, not that much machine learning, but rather a data set that we created for machine learning. Uh, and what we did is we converted uh, to Agda libraries, standard library and Unimat library, whose author is Egbert somewhere in the audience are here. Um, and we will see what we do, what we did. Um, so first, I want, aha, okay. First, um, maybe I can press, like, yeah. Um, first, we will see the motivation for our work, then we will briefly describe Agda uh, and why or when should we use Agda, and then we will describe the process of getting Agda source code into the actual graph representation that we have currently, and at the end, we will see some basic machine learning uh, in quotation marks because those methods were quite basic and they do not learn that much. Uh, so what, uh, what first, what is Agda? Um, Agda is dependently typed functional programming language. Uh, and that means that as a consequence, its types are so strong that you can express mathematical statements as a type. So for example, you can uh, state that for every natural number, there exists a larger natural number, uh, you can express the reflexivity of equality and so on and so on. Uh, and it is mostly used as a proof assistant. So if you need to consider 1 million cases in your proof, you can use a proof assistant as Agda. Or maybe if your proof is so complicated that the others won't believe you that you actually prove the result unless you formalize it in some programming language as Agda. Uh, you can again use it uh, to convince the others that your proof is actually valid. Um, and here we will just briefly describe Agda so, uh, and its syntax. So here is some file A pika Agda. Uh, so at the beginning to define the module of the same name. And then we define natural numbers. So this is taken from my PyCharm and it, it is complaining because this is some weird Unicode character. Uh, and this is one of the features that Agda has. So you can use probably whatever character you want. Um, and here we defined data type, natural numbers uh, with two constructors. The first one is zero that uh, simply gives us a natural number. And the second one is successor, which is actually a function. It takes a natural number and it will return a natural number. Um, and with these two, we can actually define uh, number one, which whose type is in line eight, a natural number, and which is defined as successor of zero. And we can also define number two, which is similar, similarly successor of one. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Igbor just said that in his library he manually typed the numbers from 1 to 20 but yeah he removed it <laughs> okay um, and now <clears throat> once we have natural numbers we can for example prove something and we will first define inequality and then we will prove that one is not strictly greater than two uh, so here is the first time where, where we can see that those types are dependent and we can also face another feature of Agda. So if we write underscore less or equal to underscore, this actually means that these two underscores will la could later be used as uh, arguments. So this is mixed fixed notation. For example, here in the line 19, I wrote one less or equal to two. Um, and this one and two are in the place of this underscore. <clears throat> and this becomes typically quite useful when, if you, for example, you have if then else operator, because then you can define if underscore then underscore else underscore. And 
write the code as I mean in natural language, right? Uh, and yeah, well, this relation or this type uh, less or equal to has again two constructors. The first one is zero should be read as zero is less than any natural number. And the other one is successor is less than successor. And well, the first one simply takes an so-called implicit argument in curly braces and returns an element of the type zero is equal or less than n, where n is an argument. And the second one actually takes two implicit arguments, so numbers n and m, and it also takes a an element of the type n is smaller or equal to m, and then returns an element of the type successor of n is less or equal to successor of n. Um, yeah. In the first line, where you say the d is less or equal to n, you have n on the left hand side and you have n on the right hand side. Is that now uh, important? No. Uh, so the question was in, in the line 15, we have n on the left hand side in the name and on the right hand side. But actually, this on the left hand side is simply a string of characters. So I, I, we could simply write z foo and bar, foo and bar yeah. Um, yeah, so there is a bit of confusion with these underscores, but here in, in the line 15 and 16, these are simply two names. Uh, we just made them meaningful. But uh, what we see here is the idiomatic use of funny and funny naming conventions in Agda. So this is how Agda people will write things because they want their constructor name on the line 15 to remind them of what it is that it, the constructor is witnessing. It's witnessing the fact that Z is less than equal to N. So that's the name they will give it. And they're very good at observing whether there are spaces or there are no spaces. <laughs> uh, okay. That's the bit that is important. Because if you wrote Z space less than equal to space N, well, then that's something different. So you really have to pay attention to spaces. And our students have lots of fun with spaces the first time they do on them. You didn't write them up there. So Where? The line 14. So in the, in the definition, there are no spaces. But there are underscores. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so to sum up for the Zoom people, um, these are just the names, and they were on purpose made meaningful so that we know what they represent. Um, so how how does the proof looks like look like? Um, so we would like to prove that one is smaller or equal to two. That means that we have to prove that this type is not empty. Um, and to prove that this type is not empty, well, we will simply create an element of this type. Uh, so we define proof, which is supposed to be of this type. One is smaller or equal to two. And then we simply write an element. Uh, what we need to do, well, we already know that zero is less than any other natural number. So we can imagine that this implicit n was set to one. And then we simply use this successor constructor, which takes a proof that zero is not greater than one and returns us an element, uh, which in our case says that one is smaller or equal to zero. And, and that's it. So I needed a bit of time to understand this philosophy, uh, but basically everything looks like that, except for the fact that then the theorems or the, um, let's say, these types became become much more complicated and, but the philosophy is like that. Um, so what can actually Agda do for us? It does all the type checking. So it actually checks that, um, for example, our proof was an element of the type one smaller or, or, or equal to two. Uh, it also checks that all the recursive calls terminate. So, for example, here we had the recursion 
recursive definition of uh, natural numbers. And if we, if we would define additional natural numbers, then Agda will check that our probably recursive definition as it is defined in this slide uh, terminates. Um, Agda also computes all the cases that need to be considered when proving something or defining something, because in Agda, uh, the functions need to be total. So you have to define them for all possible inputs or for all possible values of the given data type. Uh, and sometimes if you are unsure when writing a proof and just make a hole, like a question mark, Agda can uh, fill in that hole. Uh, but it is not very smart in doing so. Uh, so, yeah. So one other thing that it does is that it figures out uh, the values of implicit arguments. Ah, okay. Or, or it complains that it doesn't know how to do it. Okay, so yeah, the thing that is not mentioned here, Agda can also find out the values of the implicit arguments or it can, com or otherwise, if it isn't, isn't able to do so, it complains. Uh, all right. Uh, and now when we know Agda, we can actually motivate our work. Uh, so imagine that we want to prove a new theorem uh, and probably we know how to define its type. So actually we we know how to write this theorem down, but when writing the proof at some point, maybe at the very beginning, we either we do not remember what was that lemma that is somewhere in the library, or maybe we haven't the faintest idea of which lemma we should actually use. So we want to build a recommender system that would suggest uh, a user uh, appropriate candidates for these lemmas. So appropriate definitions that were already defined uh, prior in some library and that we can use not to repeat everything by ourselves again. Uh, and Agda has very simple grammar. Uh, so what we want to do now is actually take the source code and convert it into some machine learnable format. Uh, and when we went through the documentation, uh -huh, we were quite satisfied because here Agda has apparently very simple grammar. So every statement in Agda is either variable, some lambda function, defined function, and so on and so on. Um, but then again, this mixed fix notation, user defined precedence of the operators, and so on, makes parsing by hand very hard and almost impossible. Uh, so this is why Andre extended Agda uh, so that, so that uh, it can output also, I mean, it can output the definitions in much more easily parsable S expression format. Uh, so what is this S expression? Well, S expressions are again defined recursively and some atom or literal values are S expressions and a list of S expressions is also an X expression. So for example, foo as a string is an X S expression, one as an integer is an X expression, true as a boolean is an X expression. And then the lists are typically denoted with this parentheses. Uh, and if we imagine that, for example, foo is actually the name of plus function and bar is if then else operator, this actually represents a valid, um, let's say, mathematical uh, function, which, well, first computes uh, in, in this bar node what four because if true then four else five so here is four and then it sums up one and four uh, so this is much more easily easily parsable than that agda code uh, and our actual s s, s expressions uh, were actually are actually the s expression that S expressions that belong to a single Agda file. So we, we take a single Agda file, actually module, and then translate it to S expression. And this is done in several stages. Uh, so when Agda is somehow compiling and understanding what is in the source code, 
we wait until everything is type checked so that we know that everything is okay uh, and then construct abstract syntax and abstract syntax trees are created uh, as the one on the previous slide and then from 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 tree to s expression there is a really short path um, as you can imagine and at that point s expressions are created yes question and can you go back to the example yes so should there be the parentheses around the two four five so how how do i know whether bar is three arguments or bar has a single argument which is two slides to four and five yes probably i mean you do not know in advance Probably I should put parentheses in around all of the three. Um, and it's, it really is a matter of convention how you're going to represent the abstract syntax trees as S expressions. Okay. Will you show us some examples of what they actually look like? Yeah. yeah okay. So uh, we'll see the convention. Okay. And the convention is a lot more verbose and explicit than this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm, I just wanted to so okay the first question was shouldn't we have also parentheses around through around four and around five and the answer is it's a matter of convention the the, the next question was is there a difference between blue and uh, orange uh, well not really just I wanted to make the difference between literals and the others or actually I mean between actually here between the leaves and the functions uh no other difference okay so here let's say the actual s expressions uh as we obtained um every s expression has something like a type so we know that at the very top level we have a module and then every module is this is described as a list of other x expressions the first one is always module name which uh well the first one is actually tagged module name has some module hash and the actual name so in our case that would be module a uh, we are again following this example uh, so it starts with module a where and then after the module name some definitions follow so the in every definition has actually um oops three children here is an additional space that shouldn't be here the first one and again so every definition has three parts the first part is the name of the definition again module hash and fully qualified name so like natural numbers which are in module a then the type follows and then um, the actual body of the definition follows and in our case when where we are defining uh, natural numbers this tag for the body is data um, there there can be several others so we, we could define a function we could define a constructor and actually uh did, did i yes i did um, I will just show you Agda's expression. Oh, no. Let's choose this one. Um, these, these are quite verbose, right? So first we defined natural numbers. Uh, and we can see that the type is, let's say, quite... Co is this actually visible? Probably I should... Uh, okay, no. Now the zoom toolbar is bar. five. You can go to more than five meeting controls. Ah, uh, great. Right. Floating meeting controls. Control out shift page. So okay. Uh, I will just increase the fonts. Yes, font twenty. Uh, so, and we can see that in in the case of the our data type natural numbers, we have this data and we have uh defined two names which are not one and not sorry that was zero before so this is another example and then this is the constructor is actually not defined here and it goes in a separate definition so in this separate definition <clears throat> we would for example have 
uh, name uh, a n zero, uh, and in that case it wouldn't we wouldn't have in the body data, but it would be constructor, and so on and so on. Uh, mm. Yeah, question. Do you have to repeat the hash in the module because then so the question was whether do I have to repeat the hash? Uh, and the answer is yes. Yeah. It, it gives you a unique uh, identifier for this entity. Yeah. The, because you can have zero and so the problem would be, for example, if you, if you do that that underscore module, that can appear in many places and in many places, and you can define the same function. And yeah, uh, and actually the example, I mean, I won't go back, but I have defined three natural numbers. I mean, additions, and except for the hash, everything looks the same. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need the hashes. Okay, so once we have this actual S uh, these are the hashes of the modules. Yes, but we need the A after the hashes. Ah, no, 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 no. Actually, you don't need the names, but we would prefer to have them. Like, for machine reason. learning purposes, they might be informative because they tell you about the structure of things. Yeah, so the names are informative, so we can we keep them. Um, and so now a quick word about Agda libraries. So they're used almost as like ordinary, ordinary libraries because every module or text I and mean, the file is like a textbook where all the, which contains all the formalized definitions of previously defined mathematical concept, theorems, maybe some axioms and so on. And then can be, and they can be used in our proofs, like, right. And our focus today will be on standard libraries of the lib and Unimath library, which are approximately of the same size. Um, and um, now we will describe how this library is actually converted to a graph. So first we can choose a library, for example, the standard library. We, as we saw before, we convert its modules into S expressions and then from these S expressions of the modules, we can extract the definitions, right? So we, we find the subtree that belongs to definitions and to, the, to a definition and take it out. Um, and after we have the definitions, uh, we can parse them and define a graph, which has some vertices and some edges. The vertices are roughly speaking modules and definitions and there is an edge between uh, every module that defines or actually that contains a given definition. Um, and there is an edge between two definitions if the first one references the second one. Um, and here is the more exact picture of our, let's say, metagraph. So we have around two, what, four, let's say, or three major types of the nodes. So the first type is library. These are library nodes. And typically there should be only one because we converted only one library into a graph. Um, and the library contains different modules. So it can have one or more modules, probably never zero. And different modules can also contain sub modules. Um, Sometimes it happens when we do the imports that um, a, a library reference is something out of, of it. So we have also these external library nodes and external modules. Um, but in any case, modules uh, define definitions uh, or actually, I mean, they also contain definitions, but we wanted to have a different edge type. So the name of this edge is defines uh, and definitions reference other definitions uh, however we set, uh, we we have two different types of the references one type of the references is that it is another definition is referenced in a body and 
another definition is referenced in a type. Uh, this will be important when we will be constructing our machine learning models because probably we can afford that we can keep all the in type ref edges, but these should be deleted or at least some of them should be deleted. Uh, in sorry. When you say reference within the type, then you would limit reference within the type. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, yeah, what, what I mean in type, so let's go to the example back here. This, so in the specification, yeah. So, this would be references in type, and that would have an edge from proof to one and from proof to two. And this is the body where we actually define the expression. Um, uh, if we turn the slide with the, uh, with the background, so you want to say something special about uh, this having three definition nodes, or that was just convenient? I yeah, that, just for illustration. So I I could make a similar self loop as in the case of the modules. So the question was, why do we have three definition nodes? Yeah, just for convenience purposes. Um, and and that's it. Also, we, we further um, differentiate between definitions. So not all definitions are the same. Some of them are axioms, some of them are functions, some of them are constructors. Uh, and probably we can see the graph now, the actual graph which was um, ported to the Neo4j database. Uh, so for example, here I queried uh, all the library nodes and there is only one because this is Unimat library. And then I can uh, expand the node, bang. And now we, we can see uh, all the modules that it contains. And if you are, I don't know, interested in this one, which is, let's just move it in the ring theory. We can again expand it. And there are some sub modules. So for example, ring theory dot rings. And we can maybe, if you are really interested in rings, again, expand it and. Uh, now we are someplace that looks like Kevin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the comment was here yeah, we are in some place that looks like hell and yeah that is ring theory what are these numbers? yeah what are these numbers so in addition to just let's say bare notes and definitions um i have computed some statistics for every of the note of the notes so for example if we choose i don't know this one this is actually a, de a definition of a function and the chosen number um how do i do that so this is one of the statistics and now ah here it is so i will choose function this is in degree of a of a node so maybe it would be better just to show the name and uh and that would be more meaningful. And then if you, for example, want to uh, analyze the function ring theory ring, whoops, then, then you can see some statistics, for example, between us. Uh, Pro yeah, probably. Why was this name of the function? So all degree five means five. It, it references five and five, five other things. Uh, it means that the number of references is five. So maybe it references. So the question was, what is out degree? Um, in our case, this means that this ring has five references. Uh, which means that maybe it references two different things, but one of them twice and one of them three times. Mm -hmm. So it's actually count of references. And well, yeah, in degree is much larger because probably many nodes 
reference rings. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also computed some, let's say, importance of the node. So this is between us. Uh, between us is the proportion of the shortest paths in the whole graph that pass through this node. Um, and there is page rank, which was made famous by Google uh, and Mr. Page. Um, right. So many people think that it's the rank of a web page. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's not true. There's a person called Page. Yeah. <laughs> what, is, what is Neo for J? Neo for J is like SQL, but in graph format. So J stands for Java and four stands for F O R four. No, this is on my computer. So we want so the question was where is this hosted? Yeah, this is on local host. We wanted to host it like openly, but except for the enterprise version, there is no read-only access. So every everybody can say match um, match n uh, detach this means remove the edges and then delete n and <laughs> sorry why you showing well yeah uh, i'm showing when there is an end. uh well let's delete this yeah and and I mean, this works like a standard querying language. If I um, unmaximize this, and for example, I'm interested in some node uh, where the name contains a ring, and then I return n. Uh, now I will get all the nodes whose name whose names contains the word ring. Um, and yeah, it's my computer is a bit slow, but I mean, it's it works like S square, but it's like in, in graph format. That's it. Uh, uh, the nice uh, query, uh, already now we need to analyze both uh, what are the most reference uh, if you, if you uh, yeah, I can also simply compute the degrees. Um, maybe, per, well, it's slow. So, uh, so let's just summarize. You can do lots of interesting queries at this point. Yeah, right? let's say like because it's quite slow and I don't want to lose too much time. Oh, including vandalism. Including vandalism, yeah. You can do a lot. Uh, you can do everything that you can do with standard database, probably. Um, yeah, and after, so these are just some statistics. Uh, these are just summed up counts of different definitions from Unimat and standard libraries. So all in all, there are 26,000 uh, functions, almost 1,000 constructors, 150 data types, and so on. So by the way, it's maybe worth saying that function can be a function of zero arguments. Oh, OK. Like if you define three equals successor, 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 zero, it's going to count on the function. No. Okay, yeah, so, so that's just all the things that you find, which are not a constructor or name of the data. Yeah, so if we recall the times when Egbert had one, two, three, four, five, and so on, that would be considered constant functions still and would count under the functions. Uh, so function can have zero so elements. This is a uniform representation of every definitional clause in Agda. They always call it a function, but it may have zero arguments. Uh, so, for, for example, there's no reason why you would separate them. One no, is a function, and right? To just take, you don't have to take elements. So now, then, you're going to call an element something which is like sine and cosine are elements. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well, that's arguably more confusing to people who didn't do large amounts of calculus. Okay. 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 
Yeah, uh, another question. Uh, I mean, I would like to have a, a distinction between definition and proving. I mean, how is that? I mean, it seems that here there is no distinction between a definition and a proof, right? Well, a construction and a proof. A construction and a proof, yeah, that would be the, the correct. Yeah. Yes. Aha, uh -huh, there is. Because the construction is constructor. No, no, no. Constructors no. are just the basic constructor yeah. like it's zero, etc. Yeah. Or okay. cons. So yeah, we still can distinguish in the, within this uh, class, I mean in the large class of functions, we have both uh, some of them are, uh, are referring to definitions and some of them are referring to uh, to uh, yes, but yeah. so the question is how sometimes functions are the actual definitions like plus is defined via something and sometimes functions are as we saw earlier the actual theorems and proofs and Luke Shaw would like to have some distinction between those two but actually I would say this is quite hard I mean you have to somehow guess what types are functions and what types are the actual theorems we, we talked about that and we let's say we gave up more or less because i mean probably if you have many quantifiers like for all and exist probably this is a theorem but then again not necessarily um but so the author of the library if he asked paper for example he would know he would have give you a mathematical answer uh, yeah, which would be and those are the things which map into the type of propositions. Well, but uh, I would actually argue in a different direction mm -hmm. by asking okay. why do you want the distinction between the constructor and the constructor? I think I would agree with you. <laughs> Look, John, what is the uh, point of having Because I uh, somehow naively I think that with machine learning we would like to support rules. <laughs> okay. The yes. definitions are something, uh, I mean, definitions are simple to write. So the student who walked in and uh, tried to uh, uh, change the appointment from today to tomorrow, she's going to formalize in Agda. The main achievement would be that she just performs one construction called the structure sheet. Of the ring. That's the entire diploma, is that construction. <laughs> okay. Well, so I sometimes it can be very complicated. I take my comment back. But, <laughs> but also think of other things like the, the construction of an equilateral triangle from a given line segment. I wouldn't say that it's any simpler than mm -hmm. a proof. Mm -hmm. However, I think you're quite right in saying that there may be a qualitative distinction between proofs and constructions. But I think a priori, we don't know that for machine learning purposes. But, uh, so, but uh, somebody who writes these things uh, quite well know. There is, one, there is one possible reason why we would uh, want to distinguish. Um, when you are proving a mathematical fact, any proof will do. Mm -hmm. All the proofs are considered equal. You just establish a mathematical fact. But when you're making a geometric construction, they're not all equal. You care whether you constructed a, 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 an equilateral triangle or some other triangle. You're not going to say that the same thing. So that would be, and in fact, in automation, this may be important because it is easy to automate, it ought to be easier to automate proofs. Because it doesn't matter which one you find. Yeah. On the other yeah. hand, we expect the AI to always find the thing we want it to find, including <laughs> sure. constructions. But right. you can you can do that at the user level, right? The user yeah. can say, okay, I don't care which one it is, just give me any. Um, and if it's going to be a construction, then maybe the user can be the one who is going to be more careful using the AI. Yeah. So, but we cannot judge whether something is a construction or a or a proof uh, or only based on uh, the X expression. No. no, in some other proof assistants and some other type of theory, that may be possible because there is a distinction where there between a type and the proposition, and then you know by construction that you're 
going for a proposition for a logical theory. But wouldn't a human understand whether this is a like yeah, theorem? A or... human will typically know whether, well, sometimes actually Egbert's book is full of theorems which say this construction is actually a proof. And sometimes knowing this is quite important. So you write down a type and you say, are all the elements of this type equal? That means it's a logical statement if, all, if they're all equal. And sometimes this is difficult to prove. But in most cases, when the human knows what they're doing, they will have a pretty good idea that, yeah, I'm looking for a proof. Although even for humans, so while formally speaking, all proofs establish, all, all proofs are equal in the sense that they establish the same fact. They are far from equal when humans talk about proofs. So maybe we don't really want to equate them all. Yeah, for example, the, the, the decipher or something at the time, we want to go efficiently. Also, it's possible to publish a new proof on an, of an old, old fact, and it's considered original work, but, but it's still the same truth that you established. So there's something more there. I mean, I mean, get uh, actually uh, um, defining another uh, task for machine learning, which is distinguishing, you know, what is going on. I mean, uh, since we have the as expression, just so many examples, we can also maybe uh, train the machine with the students. But of course, we have some, uh, we have to have some way of example. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that's. Okay, so the debate was about whether the distinction between definitions and theorems is actually necessary. And maybe I should not repeat it. Probably. <laughs> okay. So okay. Here, are, here are some statistics about the um, S expressions that we have obtained. So these are the depths of the modules. So the S expressions that belongs to the modules and in standard library, there are approximately 300 of them uh, and the so distribution 300 modules 300 modules exactly yes. um, and the distribution of the depths of the corresponding s expressions is like that so the that's roughly the the, the depth of the abstract syntax tree yeah and, by some factor because of verbosity yeah so this is like an abstract syntax tree but probably by a factor larger because of the verbosity and this nested best module and then module names so, so. x axis is um the depth yeah so it goes from 2 to 91 and the y axis is the count 91 they must have something in there. Wait, wait, wait until we get to the <laughs> unimat. And here is the number of the nodes. <laughs> no, 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 this is still, this is, this is still standard library, but the number of the nodes. And we can see that, well, yeah, it, it can go into millions. So one of the definitions has, one million no uh, one of the modules has one of one million nodes so, but, but now node is not node means you just literally count all nodes of all the abstract trees of everything that appears in it yes so a node is parenthesis something yeah. without parenthesis okay. close parenthesis. okay more or less the size yeah yeah and here is unimat with 130 as a maximal depth oh. and, and this is the module this is the module that uh, we talked about so there is maybe so okay unimat has 800 modules sorry uh well if the definition is inside the module then the depth of the module is like the depth of the definition plus one oh just yeah 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 and well there is so somewhere somewhere you have an abstract syntax tree whose depth is roughly 130 mm -hmm. but it may be the case that that particular tree you didn't type 
Agda, yeah, for sure you did not because it has. I think that particular tree has like half of the nodes of, of your library, which, yeah. um, and there are some underscores in the type. So Agda guessed what it is. Um, yeah, so here is a distribution of Unimat. Uh, in terms of nodes, it's bigger, and in terms of models, it's bigger, but as we shall see, uh, in terms of graph statistics, it's a bit smaller than, than standard, standard library. So it has like <laughs> standard, both have approximately something above 10,000 nodes and 200,000 edges. Um, seven, both have interestingly seven weak components. And basically everything is in a one large component, except for some. How what is a weak component? If we have directed directed graph, just delete the direction of the edges and compute connected components. Oh, okay. And strongly connected are those where you can actually you take into account also the direction. Um, yeah, they they have so these cycles are actually simple cycles. Uh, there are many, mostly probably due to this some recurs recursive definitions and so on. Um, so yes, yeah, so a strong component ought to be more or less something recursive. Yeah, but I mean there are also like strong components of size sixteen or thirty, so it's not only recursive. Mm -hmm. So it, it can happen also uh, for some other reasons. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. And, uh, and that doesn't count those um, meta models like meta nodes like library and so on, just pure definitions. Uh, all right. Uh, and now we came to the machine learning part of the presentation. So, first, we will recall our motivation when we we're writing Agda Express. Uh -huh, question. Uh, well, I think you can. Yeah, so how much more have you, have you got? Uh, less than half, and we but can make a break. Let's yeah. make a short break. Okay. So Until we, let's let's continue at fifteen past. Okay. So we continue at fifteen past eleven. Stop recording. Pause no. recording. Uh, pause. Ah, but now the I escape. The press escape. Escape. Ah, great. Pause. No. Uh, press you. Okay. Control <laughs> Yeah, but also hide video camera. Not too late. Oh, what happens if you hide it? Like the talking, what they can do? I, I, I don't, don't know. know. Zoom participants don't see it. Just move it somewhere. Yeah, I will. I will. Uh, like that. So, yeah, now we, we have come to the machine learning part of the presentation. And um, our motivation for doing this machine learning was that we are writing an Agda expression, but at some point we do not know how to proceed. So in the language of our graphs, uh, we can actually, we, we know what are the nodes of the graphs, of the graph, but some edges are missing. So we, do, we don't have already an edge from some of the type references in body to some other node, we have to create it. Um, and when some edges are missing and we would like to predict them, this is called link prediction in machine learning. Um, and this is what we are actually doing. So given some node and all the background knowledge, we want to predict some unknown links. Uh, Can you give us another example of link prediction, like a canonical one in machine learning that everybody knows about? A canonical example of link prediction would be, well, everybody knows about, maybe maybe we have a graph with uh, drugs and diseases, <coughs> and not all the drugs were tested on all diseases, and maybe we know the link is between a drug and a disease, if, let's say, the drug uh, can cure the disease and well we want to predict some repurpose so this is called repurposing of the drugs and well we, we want to find new purposes and the new links 
the question from Gupta. Well, I, I just want you to add a, a more canonical example ah. on, the, uh, on Facebook, right? So you have friend suggestions. Ah, right? okay. Because the friend suggestions are using links that Facebook infers that are likely to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Lupcho gave another example. So friend suggestion on Facebook is precisely that. So suggest new links to a given node, given user. Um, all right. Um, and yeah, so this so you, next week Lupcho will be pre actually presenting how do we learn on graphs, uh, and we will we, we'll go into more details. But I will now just like briefly describe what is necessary to describe. So when we are learning, we do not want to pick into the test set, so um, into the set that we are actually predicting. So we first need to split the graph into training and testing part. And then we will learn our model only on training set and then make predictions for the test set. Um, so we, in our experiments, we assumed that the bodies of the definitions are actually empty. So we removed all the edges uh, and the descriptions of the bodies in the test set. And then for every node in the test set, we predicted its nearest neighbors. So the most similar nodes uh, from the training set. Um, because some, I mean, the edges should somehow resemble the similarity between the nodes. And this is the motivation. And the nearest neighbors, I mean, we can all, so, okay, about the nearest neighbors. So after we choose uh, some, distance measure, so not necessarily necessarily a metric, just some measure of distance. Uh, the nearest neighbor is the node where the minimum of the distances between a chosen node and other nodes is achieved. Uh, and if the distance actually measures this similarity of the nodes well, then the most uh, similar nodes are those who are actually connected to the given node. Uh, and in these preliminary experiments, we used Jacquard distance and TF-IDF based distance. We'll describe both later. Um, and yeah, uh, that's it. Okay, sorry, so, so the, how did so, Let me just see if I understand this correctly. You started with the problem of predicting a missing link. Yeah. And now you said, I'm going to do this by predicting who's the nearest neighbor yeah. to some distance, because I imagine that this distance will reflect the fact that there should be a link between them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So ju the, just to sum up, so our claim is that a good distance measure is such that the nodes that are close to each other are all in in terms of this distance measure are also connected yeah uh, and somehow this distance should also measure similarity and these are the two similarity measures that we use or actually this similarity measure. okay so the first one is jacquard distance uh that fraction is so-called jacquard index uh, uh, I will just stop recording. Yeah, go, go. Ah, okay. <laughs> no problem. So the, the first distance that we use is Jacquard distance. Um, and it is based on Jacquard similarity, which is the fraction there. So you can take two sets or two multi sets compute the size of their intersection and divide it with the size of their union. Uh, there are some worries when the sets are empty, but in our case, uh, they are never empty as we shall see. Um, and so this is well defined. And the, since the Jacquard index, which measures similarity uh, between two sets is always on the interval zero one, then we can obtain the distance simply by saying, okay, let's define the distance as one minus this similarity measure. 
and we obtain the dissimilarity measure. So if the sets A and B are equal, the Jacquard distance between them would be zero. And if they're uh, disjoint, their distance would be one. Um, and in our case, um, A, so how do we convert a definition into a set of words? Well, actually we have multisets and if we just take uh, the raw source code, then the, this uh, multiset that belongs to the definition of natural numbers would be as follows. So it, it, it says that, okay, data appears once, symbol N appears four times, one, two, three, four, symbol where appears once, uh, zero appears once and successor appears once. Uh, and I skipped this set because I wanted to fit in one line. Um, and after some pre-processing, so there, there might be more complex names as just N or I don't know, zero. So sometimes, for example, there appears some left inverse or like compound names, and we split them into, let's say, atomic parts. For example, this left inverse would be split into left and inverse. So but now you're banking on the naming convention of the Agda Uniman yeah. library and the fact that it uses these dash thingies. E, I mean, not only dashes, also uh, camel columns, case. camel cases, numbers are... Uh, so you just do some semi-intelligent splitting of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Names. We do semi-intelligent splitting of the names because, as mentioned before, people tend to Get, give meaningful names to their objects. So uh, why not match all the inverses with other inverses? Um, yeah, and that's it. So the actual multisets um, um, were obtained from the S expressions, not from this code, but that, sh that should be roughly the same. Um, and some comments, so this actually ignores the tree structure of the S expression. So actually we can imagine it as a long string and just splitting on the spaces and camel cases and so on. Uh, and actually you, I mean, when computing the nearest neighbors, what I actually had to do is use the brute force algorithm because uh, this is not actually a metric and those smart structures like, I don't know, P trees or any other KD trees uh, do not help. And this is why since I was coding everything in Python, I use Numba, which uh, accelerated things quite a bit. Um, yeah, and that's it about this. And there is the other, distance or actually mapping that we used is TF, TF IDF. So this is term frequency inverse document frequency. Um, so this was defined uh, first for words in documents. So our words would be simply those words that we saw before. And the documents are actually as expressions. Um, so first, so this is this TF-IDF score or value uh, is computed in two steps. Given a document or S expression, we we compute the relative frequency of a word in this document. So, so D is document and T is the word. Is term, yeah. T is a word and D is a document. Yeah. Maybe I can refer to terms and okay, terms and documents. It would be better, yeah. Uh, so the relative frequency, yeah, well, this is the absolute frequency divided by the sum of all absolute frequencies. So the number of words in a document and inverse document frequency. Uh, first you compute the proportion of the documents. This, so the number of no documents is N and then you compute the proportion of documents that contain uh, this given word and invert it and put it on logarithmic scale. So this is inverse document frequency. So it's large if it appears only in one place. Uh, yeah. So the other, the, um, 
for example, if the document, if a term appears in all the documents, I don't know, like maybe colon, for example, uh, then this value would be zero, right? Because logarithm of n over n, logarithm of one is zero. And its importance of that particular term would automatically be uh, zero and decreased. Um, and the TF IDF is actually the product of the two. So you, you take term frequency multiplied with this inverse document frequency and you get TF IDF. And actually what it does, um, you somehow embed a document into n dimensional, this should be capital N, Euclidean space where, where n is the number of different terms that appear in all the documents. So for actually for every document, so for every S expression, uh, you obtain a vector of the same dimensionality. Uh, typically those vectors are quite sparse, so you need to have probably some good implementation of uh, this TF IDF vectorizer, um, but they look like that, right? Uh, so TF IDFs are the products of those two terms. And once you have those vectors, well, now you have reduced the problem to computing the distance between the points in Euclidean space. And you can use whatever distance you want. Uh, for example, Euclidean distance, and uh, by doing so, nearest neighbors could be found more efficiently, but still, since the dimension is typically high, uh, brute force algorithms are not that bad. And we will end with some results and comments of the results. Uh, so this is, these are the results for uh, Jacquard-based neighbors. Um, I took 20% of the library um, and defined it as a test set. So it has approximately 2,000 nodes. Uh, some of them were skipped, sorry, Rand on random. Just a random 20% of the definitions went in the test set. Um, and I have defined two quality measures. Uh, so the first one, so the minimum rank of the actual uh, neighbor. Um, if we have a test example or test definition, then we can compute the distances to all the training nodes. And then we can see, aha, aha, this is the point where I start, I start, start writing from the table. Well, um, Ah, but there is so this is why we should have turned on that big yeah. You want to do it now? Okay, why well, how about you go on and then try to do it? Okay, okay, so keep keep working and I'll just work. Okay, yeah. So for, you can imagine then if you sort the all the neighbors that you got, so note distance, note distance, note distance, and you um uh sort them increasingly uh, with respect to the distances, then the closest neighbor would get a rank one, the second closest neighbor would get a rank two and so on and so on and so on. <clears throat> or maybe I don't even need that because I just keep going, just ignore okay. me. Uh, and then we can see where the actual neighbors of that test example that we know, but we deleted. Uh, appear in this ordered list, right? And well, it turns out that the results are not that great because the minimal rank of the actual number of the actual neighbor on average is around, well, 170. Uh, so it's not that bad because um, among 10,000 nodes or, or actually 8,000 nodes, we um, well, we are in the, let's say, first percentile. Great. Um, but user, if we suggest, so if you make a recommendation, user will never look at the first 200 recommendation, recommendations. So... Uh, Recording in progress. Oh. Uh -huh. oh, 
walls here. Okay. Ah. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah, okay. this is great. But I think people can now see this one. So if you pin it, I don't know if I can pin it. Then yeah, see this. just double click and that's probably it. Okay. Um, yeah, so just to recap, we, we may yeah. have. You didn't do anything. I have to pin it here. But okay. Ah, okay. yeah, but they can pin it by just ah, yeah. so yeah. you can pin. So now look at the one. Yes. So when we compute the nearest neighbor, so maybe this is node one at distance d1, node two at distance d2, and so on, until node k, distance dk, and all, and this list is ordered with respect to the distances. <clears throat> this got rank one, this got rank two, this got rank two, three, uh, okay. So these are all the neighbors of a node n. Yeah, these are actually all the nodes in the training set. Um, and then typically when we, you compute nearest neighbors, you said, okay, take five closest ones, that's it. And these are proclaimed nearest neighbors. Um, and so this, the first statistics, statistic says, okay, find the actual neighbors that were removed from the test set in this list. So somewhere here, somewhere here, and choose the one that is that has the lowest rank of them all. So maybe this one has rank 130. And then for this particular chosen testing node, we, we store this 130 and do that for every testing node, compute the average of uh, these numbers and get, well, 170. Okay, so if this worked perfectly, you would get one. You would get one, yeah. Because you would always, as the first thing, you would have the thing that was actually supposed to be. Yeah, done. yeah. And uh, because this is zero based Python, you, you would get zero, okay. but yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, and the other statistic, so there were on average 168 things that we thought were a better candidate than the one that yeah. actually turned out to be. Yeah, better. yeah, and we will yeah. well, we will explain why Jacquard thinks that they were better. Um, and the other statistic is well, you can find, let's say, this distance of the same neighbor and compute this distance over uh, D5. So I, I, cho I chose, uh, well, N was already taken, and I, let's say we, we want to suggest five nearest neighbors. So I, I computed this um, distance, let's say proportion. This is always, equal or greater to one. And on average, since this is typically out of the top five, of course it's larger than one, and on average it equals 1.35. Um, so the, the nearest neighbor among the true neighbors is 1.35 times more distant as the candidates that we so, would so, suggest. So those 160 things were kind of bunched together. Yeah, in a way. In a way. Yes, this, uh, this is, I mean, yeah, if we would choose the metric correctly, we would have here zero and I here one. Something closer. something closer to zero, yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's not far off, but if, if the distribution of your distance is like maybe like that, so if all the distances are very close together, maybe uh, 1.35 is, I mean, we know that it's not okay. that bad because there are spaces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, not 
yeah yeah something like that so as close to one as possible um, yeah. almost everything is within distance one from you okay and you're keeping 1.3 then that's not good yeah. Okay. I will. Oh, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, far away. I mean, the quantile is not that bad, but in absolute terms, you don't want to show the user something where the 160th thing is the thing that they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and here are some examples. Uh, now back to the slides. Um, so. These these are two examples where the distance start with 0, 0.0. Uh, the upper one is test from the test set. And when we were computing the neighbors, this part, so the actual body was deleted. Um, and only based on, on the type or the what was the Official word. The specification. The, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, okay. Okay. So on the specification or the type, actually, right unit low multiple group is closest to the left unit low multiple group, and this is where those our intelligence splitting kicks in because we know that okay, there is unit, there is low, there is mul, there is group, and everything. I mean. The only thing that is different, ah, and there is X and there is type group and either mole group. By the way, you don't see the X. You, I don't see the X, right. Um, um, so the only thing that is actually different is left and right. Um, and this is why Jacquard thinks that, well, left is very good candidate. But actually, as we can see, um, well, if we're defining something right, probably this left wouldn't be used in the body. So this is one of the suggestions where we actually missed, but Jacquard actually thinks this is a really good fit. Um, and well, similar thing happens here where we have testing example of inner inverse law multiplication inverse semi-group. Um, and we connect it to associative mal inverse semi group. Again, the types are very similar. So, type inverse semi group, mul inverse semi group, mul inverse semi group, and so on. However, uh, the probably if we are, um, I don't know, having here inverse, we would have also somewhere in the body inverse, but this associative, well, it has associative in the body. So, and the results for TF IDF are pretty much the same. So um, it only like decreases the importance of the terms that appear everywhere. But otherwise, it follows the same philosophy. Uh, so we finish with, let's say, three comments um, that actually Jacquard and this TF IDF or any other directly word-based similarities should probably not be used as, as a learning method, but rather as an additional knowledge in our knowledge graph, right? So instead of having um, blah, 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 oof. instead of having only these two links between the types of links between the definitions, we can also compute some word-based links, right? Uh, so left is very similar to right um, and stuff like that. Um, and yeah. How much does it come down to that you are just going to the topics that you're just erasing all the types that are in the structure? Uh, you, you mean like ignoring the order or yeah. you're ignoring the shapes of the things actually yeah um, so simply intuitively i would say that it is possible it, it would be possible to get much better results still ignoring the shape of the trees but having like more intelligent um embedding in, of words like like in this second case so if we would be able to uh create a mapping between words and some 
the Euclidean space such that we would have this left something minus right something equals uh, left something else minus right something else. We we would be able to do I mean, to produce quite better results because now we are not doing that. Um, and having this, for example, probably, I mean, if this, um, well, well, so here, for example, not, not left and right, but let's say inverse and associative, probably would get, go get much better predictions. Um, because here in inverse, well, it, it inverse is used, a high associative something as something else associative is used. Um, but yeah, for sure, um, when uh, if we would uh, take into account also the tree structure, uh, the they are very heavily relying on the human plane. Yeah, for now, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, but, but I mean, these are just preliminary results. So here, also the graph was taken into account more or less implicitly um, because I mean, yeah, because of its definition. And uh, once we do the real learning, which Lucho will describe next time, I think the results will get better. Um, and also, I mean, for now we are simply counting these yeah, these references, another definition, but we would we could also take into account the place where this is a reference, right? Either very high in the tree or somewhere in, in leaf or close to the leaves. Um, yeah, so I mean, and this is the third point. Yeah, we should do some real learning uh, and uh, see what happens. And that's it. Uh, Yuktra has a question. Uh, a question and a comment at the same time. I mean, uh, you established somehow uh, quite complex phase lines. I mean, I would first explore how difficult it is to recommend in this particular case by just recommending the, the uh, nodes with the five page runs. You don't have to ah, do anything. Okay. You just because you have this graph now, and on the training graph, you can see how popular are the uh, different. I mean, how many references they uh, have different nodes, and, and then just recommend the most popular ones all the time, and then measure your uh, metric. Okay. Your, 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 uh, you know your. Uh, Say the evaluation metrics like the distance, uh, what is the length of the, yeah, the, yeah. the average length of the uh, neighbor. And uh, that would be, I think, the first baseline we should, we should establish because then we would know how difficult it is. You know, it's like only popular nodes are being reused all the time, maybe. You know. Okay. I don't think we are facing a, a simple problem, but we should. At least be aware. Okay, yeah. So Lucho's suggestion was to uh, use even less complex methods. I mean, even simpler methods to just have a constant suggestions that always predict the most popular nodes where the popularity is either measured with page rank or any other of those. Irrespective of what you're trying to link or what no. Yeah, just. Give it well, but that, that would disrespect your context in, in a certain yeah. way. But it would say just well, you know, many people use implication. Many, yeah, many, yeah. many people use implication. Why don't you use implication? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know it's a stupid recommendation, yeah, yeah, but, but it, I want to see how. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. 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 It's not difficult, right? Because it should be difficult to make something that's worse than that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Anything that's worse than that is probably doing positive harm. Yeah, you can always suggest the least. Yeah. So, like the default, and then we can compute like yeah. a relative so improvement. Say, well, yeah, so sure. Slightly better or worse than that with this 158 or whatever, and then to see what is the real. Uh, 
Okay. True. And so I'm thinking that for code, the distance isn't the uh, similarity isn't the best prediction of having a connection, right? Because if we have two functions f and g that both reference the same other definition, then most likely f won't use g because if you're writing your code modularly and f uses g. And mm -hmm. G references a bunch of other stuff. Then F won't reference them again because G is already doing that work. You know what I mean? I see. It's sort of a separation of concerns kind of thing. Yeah, but I mean, like, like if two functions are very similar, that means that you copy pasted one and slightly modified it, so you. The first one we use the, the second one we use the yeah i think that goes along with the comment there that the stuff that was computed here should yeah. be more like additional yeah. edges but telling you these two things are related but you wouldn't use one for the purposes of the other yeah they are related but, but they're but, but not one is not to be recommended even yeah, even when you're considering the better other. distance this like it's a prediction for yeah. something, but it's not a prediction yeah. for a main thing. Right. Yeah. So, well, well, I'm sorry, I'm just going to agree with the comment on that. I, I still think, right, as Andre said, that the distance should be taken into account. Yeah. That might be, uh, might be counterintuitive in terms that the learning for the algorithm should take into account that the, the, yeah. the, the, the nearest neighbor does not do it. Yeah. Or, I mean, it's something like this. Yeah. Oh, you're trying to write something similar. Let's. Yeah. Look what the other people have done. Yeah, right? yeah. Or you you define the associativity, and you're now trying to write down the commutativity or 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 uh, inverse law. Please don't suggest associativity. I just did that, right? Yeah. It's not going to happen again. But sometimes it will. You should you should suggest the neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. The, not the not the yeah. The word I have a, another uh, idea. So to make your graph slightly larger. So you, the way you have your graph done now is you have a definition and then you draw an edge whenever one thing references another. Yeah. But you could just literally insert all the abstract syntax trees into your graph and then you're done. Sorry, can you, you can just literally insert all abstract syntax trees in your graph. Instead of saying, when I define foo, it references bar and buzz, you say foo, links to its definition which is an abstract syntax tree and this abstract syntax tree then points to bar and buzz mm -hmm. and so now you have two abstract syntax tree of its definition and then inside that tree you get a link to and now you now now you have complete information now you're not ignoring the fact that the content it's there the tree you might have to label things and say oh this is an external definition versus this this yeah. thing here, this is like part of an abstract syntax tree. So either inside the definition, um, play with that. But that would be a good excuse to buy lots more computers because your graph is going to get a lot bigger. But it only has all information if you remember which branch does that and write. Yeah, which you do. Anyway. Oh, uh, oh, you see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Yes. So maybe that's a further refinement to think about whether. The tree, whether in the tree you forget the ordering of the, yeah. it's an order tree. You know, this is the first child, this is the second child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe you uh, you label them when you have the edges. You just say this was the first edge, this was the second edge, yeah. the third edge. Or you and can preserve the uh, order information. You can do that. Ah, you do that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You do something yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. There are edges indicating the order. They can be of a different quality. You can label them as this is an edge oh, imposing an order. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> or, yeah. yeah in fact, you can overlay any number of relations, mm -hmm. yeah. and you can remember which relation each edge yeah. came from. So, how, how long does it take you to compute this uh, graph? Uh, yeah, it takes. It yeah. takes. 
let's say around on, on this laptop. Yeah. It takes 10 minutes to parse uh, S expressions into this internal representation that I'm using. So that's that's once you have already compared it the whole library to it. Yes. Which takes exactly as long as the compilation of the library. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because it is the compilation of the library. Uh, it's like generate it's exactly like generating HTML files, except you're saving S S expressions. Okay. So this you get larger files, so it's slightly slower. Okay. This is like five minutes, I would say, and most of these minutes okay. are from that mm -hmm. 130. And yeah, then it's 10 minutes for the extracting the definitions, and then for knowledge graph, it, it would be again 10 minutes, but mm -hmm. computing those statistics like in between us page rank. Um, one of them is really expensive. This is current base in between us, which actually follows these Kirchhoff laws, laws of electrical currents and stuff like that. And that, and if I skip that, it would take approximately 20 minutes. If I include this, it takes more than a day <laughs> for both of two, both of the libraries so, combined. And when the library updates, do you have to recompile it or re recompute the whole graph and relearn all the things that you learned? Or can you somehow reuse what you learned on the previous? Uh, I could oh implement God. things so that the graphs would need to be recomputed. Yeah. But those statistics, well, I think they should be recomputed from scratch, yeah. probably. Okay. Um, I mean, that's not that big of a deal, right? I mean, okay. Machine learning people do things that are much, much worse than this. We're nowhere close to being shocked by the size of the thing. Yeah, so we would have problems if we take and raise the idea of actually including every node of every tree in the graph, mm -hmm. because then we would go into millions. But for now, I mean, ten thousand is not that bad. So, okay. so long as you actually consider doing things on your laptop, that means you're doing something small. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, my comment on that would be you know, just to say that, yeah, what is expensive is the node property. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, now, it might be even that uh, there are some incremental algorithms for calculating this node property. I'm not really aware. You can probably check. But it's not. With the incremental, I don't know. I mean, for example, the problem is not important to think about. No, no. Yeah. These, these were like just more for fun, like having everything in one place. If somebody wants to click, then he or she has this information. Maybe the other issue wants to start to learn because there are uh, different classes of algorithms. Some of them are learning from uh, scratch every time, and these are incremental. Ah, okay. And then you operate your library, you operate your graph, and then you see whether you should learn from scratch or you should uh, even enter the tool. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How much is that going to affect updating that? Yeah, yeah. 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 that yeah. was the element when you start to use it. So, what would you be more you know, driving the writing the learning of the library space? space more something that you're, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's actually yeah but your training data is actually changing and that and that's the most the whole definition of the machine that it uh keep pace with the change in training results i mean one way is to relearn everything every time uh if your learning is fast enough that's good uh, but uh, you would also consider incremental i mean even for the nearest neighbors this is a great example if a new node appears, you probably do not want to compute all the distances again, right? Mm -hmm. Just just the new ones. <clears throat> what is the page rank of the Europeo back then? No idea. You forget a number, and <laughs> if you don't know how it compares to other numbers, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Much. 
But what we can do, we can we'll test, we can test, we can test uh, Egbert instead of searching for you. He should tell you where to click because he should oh, know where. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Let me just close these bit pictures. So yeah. let's start in library. Which library? Before that, you okay. Yeah. <laughs> click. Okay. Uh, foundation core probably. So foundation. Let's. That's a lot of foundation. <laughs> That's like the <laughs> no, so these are modules. Which module? Ah, okay. Match. Uh, <laughs> like, let's do it like that. This is module like uh, awareness. Um, oops. So, yeah. Contains. So this is this is um, case sensitive. Yeah, yeah, it's lowercase. It's lowercase, okay. Return n uh, match. Ah, yeah, sorry. Where no dot name. Okay, which one? It's like that. Uh, uh, which question behind which door? So this is this is table. I want to find the one I need to come open for. This one? Yeah. Okay, permission coordinate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because it's the only one that's yeah, okay. continuous with core. Yeah. Bank. That's foundation core. Okay. This is like what okay. makes the partial go? Uh, 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 yeah, this, this last one is just to repeat the uh, last one. But then maybe, yeah, but it's always the fully qualified name. Yeah, maybe system. maybe for the graph. You hide information by, yeah. uh, you, by just, Maybe just inverse it. Mm. Yeah. Now, now what? Yeah, one of these. <laughs> I don't know. There's ten of them. Click on all ten of them. Inside definition. The equivalence, yeah. For the equivalence, it should be an axiom. Maybe it's a brown one. Ah. Yeah. yeah. There you go. What do you want to figure it? Oh, yeah. quite low. Uh, Nobody needs this. Five theories. That's a fact. Captain Lovett is right. Seven, right? Yeah. In degree should be given. So out degree is two and in degree is five. So that means five things references. Yeah. Oh, so you probably reference it through something else. Exactly. I'm, uh, I'm not going back to the independence, but through something that uses the independence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. This I do a lot in the library. Yeah. So, in fact, this is going to be an issue, right? Yeah, you consider something to be fundamental like univalence, mm -hmm. but in fact, what you do is you use it a couple of times and then you use those things a billion yeah. times. But there should be a machine learning algorithm that can deal with that sort of phenomenon. Oh, I will, uh, yes, in blending some, some graph nodes to make it the explanation of the data. Excellent. Uh, so, this is a very good. Borrow down the line and then recommend something at the end of it. You want to recommend just the right thing. The thing that uh, Egbert prepared for everybody to know. For the standard thing, just recommend what you are doing. Maybe yes. All right. Okay. Stop cool. recording. Thank you. Yep. Thank so, you. Yeah.